Um, hello and welcome everybody to this virtual meeting of the Royal Meteorological Society. Uh, I'm delighted that you're able to join us for the Royal Meteorological Society's presidential address. Uh, and I'm, I'll introduce our president, Dave Griggs, in a minute, but I've just uh, got a couple of slides I need to go through. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Professor Liz Bentley. I'm chief executive here at the Royal Meteorological Society. Um, so I have a little bit of uh, admin just to cover before we get the, the meeting underway. Uh, the first really is, is just regarding um, etiquette on a virtual meeting, so if we can all make sure that our microphones are on mute and our videos are switched off. Um, if you have any questions for Dave, please feel free to add them to the chat, which is on the right hand side of Demio. Um, and you can add them as the, pres uh, as the uh, session is going along, as the presentation takes place, or during the Q&A. We'll have a good half an hour or so to take questions and answers at the end of, of Dave's presentation. Um, hopefully we'll get through all those questions, but just, just to warn you, if there are lots of questions, there may not be time to get them all done before we have to close the meeting. Um, so yeah, without further ado, um, I'll cover off uh, the membership of the Royal Meteorological Society. I'm sure many of you are members already of the society, um, but uh, would encourage those of you who aren't to consider joining the society. There's a number of benefits of being a member of the Royal Meteorological Society shown here, and a website link at the bottom of this slide if you want to find out more about membership of the Royal Meteorological Society. But I'd like to now introduce our speaker, um, President of the Royal Meteorological Society, Professor David Griggs. Um, so Dave is a, an adjunct professor uh, of sustainable development at Monash University in Australia and honorary professor at the Warwick University in the UK. He was founder and director of Warwick University's Institute for Global Sustainable Development. Uh, and prior to that, he was director of Monash uh, uh, Sustainable Development Institute and chief executive officer of Climate Works Australia. Previous positions to that, he um, was the UK Met Office deputy chief scientist, director of the Hadley Centre for Climate Change, and head of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the Scientific Assessment Unit. Dave's also been past vice president, sorry, past vice chair of the World Climate Research Programme and was heavily involved in the development of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. Dave took up the role of vice president here at the Royal Meteorological Society in October 2019 as president elect and became our president uh, in October 2020. So he's about halfway through his two year term as president of the Royal Met Society. And one of the, uh, the roles of being president is to give the presidential lecture, which is what we're here to do today. And when we first spoke to Dave about taking on the role of president, obviously prior to the pandemic, I guess none of us knew the impact the pandemic would have on all of our lives. And here it is today having an impact, I guess, on the presidential lecture as well. Normally this would be given at one of our face-to-face -face events, but um, like many other organisations, uh, events are being run virtually. Uh, like many of us. And so uh, presidential lecture is virtual for the first time. Uh, and I'm delighted, as I said, to welcome you all to this event. So I'm gonna hand over to Dave, um, who's gonna give us a presentation on the role of weather and climate in achieving a sustainable future. Over to you, Dave. Yeah, uh, thanks, Liz. Um, yes, as you say, it's, it's one of the obligations, I think, of being president is to give the presidential address. Um, it's, it's a great honour to be president of the Royal Meteorological Society and it's a great honour to be giving this president's address. Um, as Liz said, I really wish I could be giving it in person. Um, it would be much more interactive and I'm sure we'd have a much better time if I could give it in person. Um, but at least I can console myself with the, the thought that I can at least imagine that you're all sitting attentively throughout the entire presentation and not falling asleep and going and making a cup of coffee. So, moving on to the presentation. Um, the role of weather and climate in achieving a sustainable future. I guess as, you're, as this is a, a Royal Meteorological Society meeting, weather and climate are terms you're probably fairly familiar with, but maybe achieving a sustainable future um, is perhaps um, not such a, um, a, a sort of a common um, phrase, if you like. So I'm going to unpick, uh, I'm going to pick up at the scab of what I mean by a sustainable future for a while. Sustainability or sustainable development, everything has to be sustainable these days. You can get sustainable mining, sustainable 
toothpaste, sustainable, you're washing up powder, every, everything has to be sustainable. It's become a complete buzzword which, to the point where it's become almost meaningless in some circumstances. And many of the claims about sustainable products are what we call greenwash, where people are simply using the, state, the statement that they're green to try and get people to buy their stuff. Because of that, there are lots of um, standards and certification schemes that have cropped up to, to, to try and you know, show people you know, how responsible their particular products are. And there's a whole bunch of logos here on the bottom right hand corner showing all of the certification schemes and standards and so on. But it's really hard to, to try and you know, find the wood for the trees, even if it is FSC certified. So there are hundreds of definitions and models of sustainable development, but what does, what does it all mean? There are, again, hundreds of models of sustainable development. These are just some of the, uh, of the models that people have come up with. My particular favorite is uh, on the sort of second row from the bottom on the far right hand side, known as the known as the Mickey Mouse model of sustainable development for obvious reasons. My particular favorite is the one uh, right next to that where it has the three sort of concentric circles where economy is sitting within society and sitting within the environment. And most of them are more like the ones up on the top left hand corner where there are three pillars of sustainable development, social, economic and environmental. There are hundreds of definitions of sustainable development. But fortunately, uh, one of them seems to have sort of come to the fore as, as the one that everybody really uses. Uh, and that's very convenient. And it's the one that was used as the basis for negotiating the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And that definition uh, came about as part of the Brundtland Commission of the United Nations in 1987. And it's something that is you know, imprinted on my brain. Sustainable development is development that meets, of the, need, meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So what it says is we need to be able to have development which allows us to live well today, but in a way that also doesn't disallow future generations to also live well in the future. And this World Summit also noted that this requires the reconciliation of environmental, social and economic demands, those three pillars of sustainable development. So let's just um, d dig into those three pillars of sustainable development a little bit more. Social justice, economic prosperity and environmental protection. And you'll find a lot of work you know, it goes on in, in each of these three pillars. But what I'm going to argue as part of this talk is that that work has to uh, be integrated. You have to integrate those three. You can't simply work on one aspect because that could have negative impacts on one of the other aspects. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that a little bit. You know, why do we need to work on all of those three things simultaneously? Well, let's just look at the consequences if we succeed in having two of those things and not the third. So in one example where we have social justice and economic prosperity. So the world is wealthy. That world is fairly distributed. Um, but we've destroyed the environment. And uh, you know, that, the environment is what all of that wealth is, is both now and in the future. And that leads to the, the, the very common terminology now, you know, no jobs on a dead planet. So clearly that, that isn't sustainable. So what if we have social justice and environmental protection? So the world is fair and we've managed to protect the environment, but the economy's failed. So, so everyone is just equally poor and unable to buy food, medicine and basic, basic essentials. So clearly that's not sustainable. And what if we have economic prosperity and environmental protection? Well, so there's plenty of wealth in the world and we've protected the environment, but that wealth is all hived away in the hands of a few people and the vast majority of the world you know, are left in, in need. Then for the vast majority, for those vast majority of people in need, that's not a sustainable future. So I can't emphasize enough that we need to work on all three elements together social justice, economic prosperity, and environmental protection, and all three are equally important. So you can no longer be a development specialist. You have to be a sustainable development specialist. So I've given you the definition. Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So are we meeting the needs of the present? And here we're going to run a short video. So, Kat, if you could this run the, the video. This is the story of how one species again. changed a planet.
The latest chapter of our story begins in England 250 years ago. Fueled by coal, then oil, several brilliant inventions appeared. They ignited the Industrial Revolution, which spread like wildfire through Europe, North America, Japan, then elsewhere. The great railways, then cars and highways, connected people across the globe. Medical discoveries saved millions of lives. New artificial fertilizers meant we could feed more people. Population rose rapidly. But this was nothing compared with what was to come. The 1950s marked the beginning of the Great Acceleration. Globalization, marketing, tourism and huge investments helped fuel enormous growth. People swarmed to cities, which became even more powerful engines of creativity. In a single lifetime, the well-being of millions has improved beyond measure. Health, wealth, security, longevity, never have so many had so much. Yet one billion are malnourished. In a single lifetime, we have grown into a phenomenal global force. We move more sediment and rock annually than all natural processes, such as erosion and rivers. We manage three quarters of all land outside the ice sheets. Greenhouse gas levels this high have not been seen for over one million years. Temperatures are increasing. We have made a hole in the ozone layer. We are losing biodiversity. Many of the world's deltas are sinking due to damming, mining and other causes. Sea level is rising. Ocean acidification is a real threat. We are altering Earth's natural cycles. We have entered the Anthropocene, a new geological epoch dominated by humanity. This relentless pressure on our planet risks unprecedented destabilization. But our creativity, energy and industry offer hope. We have shaped our past. We are shaping our present. We can shape our future. You and I are part of this story. We are the first generation to realize this new responsibility. As the population grows to nine billion, we must find a safe operating space for humanity, for the sake of future generations. Welcome to the Anthropocene. Thanks, Kat. We can move back to the presentation now. So what you can see there is that development since the 1950s has, as it said, the Great Acceleration has accelerated rapidly. But that development has not always taken place in a sustainable way. So when we look at whether we're currently meeting the needs of the present, uh, recent estimates for global poverty are that 8.6 of the world or 736 million people live in extreme poverty on less than a uh, dollar 90 a day US, uh, according to the World Bank. More than 820 million people, 11% of the world's population are hungry globally. About 400 million people, about 5% do not have access to essential healthcare services. About 790 million people, 11% of the world's population are without access to reticulated water. An estimated 1.8 billion people, 25% of the world's population are without access to adequate sanitation. The world's richest 1% have more wealth than the poorest 90%. And the richest 22 men in the world have more wealth than all of the women in Africa. And the world's 10 biggest corporations together have revenue greater than 180 poorest countries combined. And that's out of 196. So those 10 biggest corporations have more wealth combined than the uh, 180 out of 196 countries in the world. So clearly, uh, we're not meeting the needs of the present. Are we also compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs? And I don't need to talk to most of the people in the audience here to say that on current trajectories, we're heading for a global warming of between three and four degrees by 2100, albeit you know, Paris agreements notwithstanding. Uh, we're losing biodiversity at a record rate, and it's estimated that we could lose something between 25 to 40% of all of the world's species uh, to become extinct by 2100. 
And the 28th of July was the Earth Overshoot Day, the day in which, uh, as, a, as a world, we've uh, used up all of the resources that the world can regenerate within that year. So, I mean, it's a long way of saying we're not very sustainable at the moment. So there have been efforts to try and make the world more sustainable for many, many years, decades, centuries. But the first sort of concerted global effort to uh, uh, address sustainable development were the Millennium Development Goals, which came around about in the year 2000 and lasted until about the year 2015. They were at the, the initiative of UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and his uh, Chief Economic Advisor Jeffrey Sachs. And they came up with these eight goals, eradicate extreme poverty and hunger, universal primary education, gender equality and empower women, child mortality, maternal health, HIV, malaria, AIDS and other diseases, environmental sustainability and a global partnership for development. Now one thing you'll notice is that most of those goals address largely the, the social pillar of sustainable development. There is one, ensure environmental sustainability that addresses the environmental, but frankly that was rather ignored. And there's nothing there that addresses the economic pillar at all. But that's not to say that the, um, the Millennium Development Goals were without value. They had some real achievements. Um, in terms of eradicating extreme poverty and hunger, the number of people living on less than $1.25 a day in developing countries fell from 47% in 1990 to 14% in 2015. Now, some people would argue that that's simply due to the developments that have taken place in China and the economic growth that's taken place in China, rather than an achievement of the MDGs themselves. But nonetheless, it's an achievement. And un achieving universal primary education, for example, primary school enrollment in sub-Saharan Africa went up from 52% in 1990 to 80% in 2015. Um, although, again, there are some drawbacks in that the target was set was simply to have people in in primary education. It didn't actually dictate what the quality of that education should be. So in many cases, the quality of that education was still left wanting. But nonetheless, the, the, the Millennium Development Goals had some, some significant achievements. However, we also went backwards in some areas, and particularly in terms of things like inequality uh, and wealth inequality in particular, although you could argue gender equality also and, and, and other types of equality. Certainly in climate change and the environment, we've, you know, greenhouse gas levels are still are still increasing and so on. And in things like areas such as conflict and refugees, where the number of uh, refugees and areas of conflict around the world have, have continued to increase. So coming to the end of the Millennium Development Goals towards about 2012, the question was, so, so what next? And I could give you an entire lecture on what happened next, which is you know, to try and come up with a set of sustainable development goals. In fact, I did give a lecture last week, an entire lecture last week, on just the process of coming up with a set of sustainable development goals. But here you're only going to get one slide and about half a minute. So uh, I've comp I'm compressing a lot of information into a very short period of time. But essentially two things. The first thing is um, the, it was stressed that um, it, this was negotiated by the UN through a thing called the United Nations Open Working Group, following on from a number of initiatives, um, such as, uh, well, we wrote a paper in Nature, in 2013, and there was a high-level panel of eminent persons, co-chaired by Tony Blair, but all of those things fed into this UN Open Working Group to negotiate a set of sustainable development goals. And this is the mandate that they were given. Um, the first thing is that don't forget the MDGs. The MDGs are a good thing. The developing countries like them. They've made progress. So it said the development of these goals should not divert focus or effort from the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals. But then, we came, then they came up with this next sentence, which is here in bold, and it's my favorite sentence of all time. I think we should give a, a gold statue um, to whoever came up with this sentence, and then, I'd, I, frankly, I'd like to beat them over the head with it, because it's both brilliant and horrible at the same time. So I'm going to read it through slowly. So we also underscore that sustainable development goals should be action-oriented, concise, easy to communicate, limited in number, aspirational, global in nature, and universally applicable to all countries while taking into account different national realities, capacities, and levels of development, and respecting national priorities. Uh, you know, and then, you know, tomorrow we'll do something really hard. Now, how are you going to get all of the world's nations to agree a pathway towards a sustainable future through a small number of easy to communicate goals 
uh, that apply to every country and takes into account all their different national realities. Um, Mind-blowing. So I'm going to jump to the end. I'm not going to go through the years of, of heartache and pain that, that was caused by in terms of negotiating these things. And I, I took part in those negotiations in New York as uh, representing the International Science Council um, in those negotiations. This is what we came up with, and they clearly failed, because if you look here, um, concise and easy to communicate, limited in number. Well, well, there's a fail, because 17 is hardly concise. Uh, people have argued, argued that they are certainly not easy to communicate, and they're certainly not limited in number. I mean, we only had um, 10 commandments, but you know, somehow we need to find 17 sustainable development goals. But just getting them was, uh, was just the most incredible achievement. Uh, and if you actually look at them, and here's, here's a short, these are just a shorthand to try and make them easier to communicate. No poverty, zero hunger, good health, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent and sustainable economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace and justice, and partnerships for the goals. And I think it's hard to argue that if we address those things, the world wouldn't be a more sustainable place. So while they might not be perfect, there may be a political compromise, there may be gaps, there may be overlaps. They have set a framework for what we are trying to achieve for a set of sustainable development into the future. And that is a remarkable achievement. So what's happened? Well, they have been embraced surprisingly well, I would say. Not perfect by any means, but most aid agencies have aligned their donation to the SDGs. Most of the large foundations have, the Gates Foundation, Clinton Foundation, and so on, have aligned against the SDGs. And you know, businesses uh, have embraced many, many large communities and businesses have, have embraced the SDGs. When I opened my pension statement last week, uh, the first page of my pension statement showed this exact logo and and articulated how all of their investments of my, my pension money have been aligned against the SDGs. So they are being used and, and are being taken up. Alongside those, there are um, an agenda for sustainable development. And I'm really just going to focus on the last bullet here, which is a, a departure from the Millennium Development Goals, which were to reduce poverty, to reduce hunger. Whereas with the SDGs, they're more ambitious. They are, we're going to eliminate these things. So that as we embark on this collective journey, the pledge is that no one will be left behind. It's not just enough to say we're going to be reduce it from 50% to 10%. We want no one to be left behind. And yeah, there, there are 17 goals which if, you know, sit you know, separately, uh, but the UN Secretary General described these as an indivisible whole. And if countries ignore the overlaps and simply start trying to tick off targets one by one, they risk perverse outcomes and missing potential synergies. So if you do something good here, you can also do something good over there. Or if you do something good here, you, you might do something bad over here. An obvious example, if you use coal to improve energy access, if I'm trying to improve energy access and I build a, build a coal-fired power station, I've met my goal of, of, of improving energy access. But I've undermined goals 13 and 14, life underwater and life on land, uh, by accelerating climate change and acidifying the oceans, as well as um, having, you know, obviously negative impacts on, on goal three, which is health. And there are, you, know, you can come up with many, many examples. And if you're interested, there's a, um, a, a very in-depth report by the International Science Council on how to try and manage these interactions, of which I was a co-author. But now I'm going to turn for the rest of this talk. So I've, I've now set the framework of what we're trying to achieve. Uh, and so how does weather and climate play into this? And for this, I'm going to draw largely on a, on a paper which we produced last year, uh, which was co-authored by myself, Mark Stafford-Smith from Australia, your esteemed um, previous president of the Royal Meteorological Society, David Warlow, uh, Roger Street from Canada, Carolina Vera from Argentina, Michelle Scobie from Trinidad, and Yuba Sakona from Mali, which was published in Nature Reviews, Earth and Environment. So here I'm going a little bit off, off track and it's more of a personal reflection rather than a sort of factual segment. But the first thing to say is that weather and climate impacts on every sustainable development goal and in, in many, many ways. I mean, I've just jotted down a, a few obvious ones, but they're, they're, they are so at the foundation of every sustainable development. Some are pretty obvious. 
you know, risk to agriculture. Well, of course, weather affects agriculture. And so therefore, you know, if, if things don't grow, then that has an impact on poverty and hunger. Obvious. Um, you know, some of them are becoming more obvious. Things like uh, health, you know, obviously things like floods and storms have direct impacts, but they kill people. But also there are indirect effects such as the um, the movement due to climate change of vectors, the spread of vector-borne diseases due, you know, of, due to malaria and so on, such as malaria, moving into new areas as a result of climate change. Some of them are, are maybe less intuitive, things like um, you know, inequality. Uh, why do weather and climate impact on inequality? Well, just one example is that most subsistence farmers are women. And so if weather and climate affects subsistence farming, which it clearly does, then the majority of the, those affected, directly affected, are women. Um, the um, things like peace and security, where um, the major droughts in Russia and, and around the world you know, acted as one of the triggers for the, for the Arab uprising. So there are interlinkages across all of these things, and I obviously don't have time to go into any detail. The takeaway message is that weather and climate impacts on every sustainable development goal and sits at the foundation of achieving every sustainable development goal. So the question is, are we as a weather and climate community doing what we can to, to, to feed into that? So what's the current situation? And here I'm going to offend lots of people, but not for the first time, I'm sure, um, because there are many people in, in things like climate services doing great work and, and developing innovative new services in, in the climate area. And, and that, that, that science and that, that development has, has, has come on leaps and bounds over the next t the last 10 years. But of course, when you make sweeping generalizations, you can make sweeping generalizations. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, so there's a range of weather and climate services that are packaged in ways that support decision making, no, no doubt about that. But I would argue that they tend not to address quite so well which decision making processes need what information and why they need it. And there are obviously some very good examples, and in fact, I'll mention some of them later. Uh, but climate services tend to be limited to specific situations and sustainable development goals, such as life on land or life underwater or agriculture, where the need for weather and climate, climate information is fairly clear and obvious. It's fairly clear that you know, gritters, road gritters need, need weather forecasts. It's fairly obvious that you know, if you're building a wind farm, you need what, to know what the wind climatology is. It's not so obvious that you know, when you're looking at gender equality, you need weather and climate information, or whether you're looking at peace and security, you need climate information. However, it's been demonstrated that weather and climate substantially impinge on a, across all the sustainable development goals. And while there are case studies of good practice, these are not universal. And the decision-making context is key. So the decision process itself, and whether the decision makers who are at the, the end of the pipeline to use the information, are resourced, experienced, and able to interpret and use the data we, that we give them. So we, we throw the stuff over the fence, uh, and we're coming much better at tailoring that to, to users' needs. I know we are. Um, but in many cases, the policy makers don't even know what information they need. So how can we tailor the services that they don't even know that they want, and so on? So weather and climate impacts deliver various levels of complexity for decision makers. And decision making tends to sit within departmental and disciplinary silos. And I'll, I'll, I'll burrow into that a little bit more um, a bit later on. So responsibility between government departments and between the public and private sector are unclear and weather and climate impact across all SDGs. So this term action coherence came up and I'm not going to um, dwell on it. It says basically that we all need to work together to achieve the SDGs, otherwise everything sits in these silos. And if we don't work together, then it's not going to work. So why don't we all work together? Well, there are good reasons. Well, the first thing is, as I said, everything is siloed. Government departments, company divisions, university faculties, international institutions are all organized into discipline and sector-based silos. And that simplifies decision-making, makes taking action easier. Systems are set up to be competitive. Government departments compete for budget, businesses compete for market share, universities compete for research income and students, uh, non-governmental organizations compete for philanthropic funding, so how in a competitive system do you form the partnerships that you need? And there is a significant overhead in acting coherently. In time, effort, money, you have to understand where the other people are coming from, seeing the issues from their perspective, 
So it takes time and money to do that, but you need to because it gives you a better outcome. And to further complicate it, there, are, <laughs> there isn't just one type of weather and climate information. There's everything from short range forecasts and medium range forecasts and seasonal forecasts and severe weather warnings. And on the climate side, historical climate information and current climate trains and projections of climate change and, and so on. So to a, to a user, that's a, you know, that, that's a minefield of, of confusion. So what we tried to do in this paper, and this is where we start to walk out along you know, on the tree on a fairly um, slender limb to the danger that we're gonna fall off, is we try to categorize these into types of weather and climate impacts. So the first one is short-term reactions to weather and climate forecasts with little to substantial further processing. So this is like the, the, your daily weather forecasts or your air quality forecasts or your pollen alerts or early warning systems for disasters where you can actually throw out the, the weather and climate information or the processed information and people have, by and large know how to use it. The second is long-term responses to climate change where limited processing is needed. So some tech se sectors have the capacity to analyze impacts of climate just risks such as the insurance sector, uh, food and agriculture sector have become quite sophisticated in doing this, but other sectors you know, are, are, still at, are still at ground zero. Then there's the long-term responses to climate change where the sector needs substantial further processing. In principle, we know what processing is needed. We know how to, we, we need, what we need to do to the weather and climate information, but in order to use it, decision makers must integrate that into their climate data and policy into complex multi-level sustainable development priorities and goals. So they have to work across different sectors uh, and that makes it much more complex. And then finally, and this is the one I want to focus a little bit of time on, is responses to systemic risks. And this is where we get into the Donald Rumsfeld territory of, uh, you know, this is what we don't know what we don't know, where it's often not well established what weather and climate information is needed or how to use it. And data information processing and access structures are predominantly siloed, that challenges integration and these, system, these systemic um, impacts, by definition, because they're system-wide, um, have impacts across a wide range of sectors and silos and, and decisions and departments and so on. So uh, to, to make that a little bit clearer, I'll, I'll give you an example. So what do COVID, a drought in Taiwan and a storm in Texas have in common? The answer is Chippegeddon. If you've not heard the term Chippegeddon, I'll tell you what it is. So, during COVID, when we all started learning from home and having virtual presidential lectures and so on, um, the demand for consumer electronics surged. Taiwan produces around 60 to 70% of the world's semiconductor chips and 90% of the world's most advanced ones. Making computer chips is incredibly water intensive. A single silicon wafer needs about 8,000 liters of water to produce it. But Taiwan is usually pretty wet with three typhoons a year on average. But in 2020, they didn't get any. So Taiwan is now in the grip of the worst drought in 56 years. Uh, combine that with a, a, a severe winter storm in Texas, which shut down US semiconductor factories, and these are the consequences. Uh, well, Apple had to delay the re release of its new iPhone, and there's, from just a few weeks ago, a headline from the BBC News that Apple shares drop on iPhone 13 production fears. Production lines of all the major car manufacturers have had to shut down. <coughs> Excuse me. Peugeot have even resorted to replacing digital speedometers with old analog ones in, in one of its models. And Joe Biden is so worried that he convened a special chip shortage summit with heads of big tech firms to try and boost domestic production. And he's looking to push in about $50 billion to beef up America's capacity to produce um, silicon chips. But I bet when he sat around the table with those heads of those big tech firms, the head of climatology at the National Weather Service was not sitting around that table saying, well, you better not put your new plant there because um, you know, you're in the path of you know, major storms or you better not put it there because the, the, the snowpack in the Sierra Nevada is um, disappearing due to climate change. So you're not gonna have enough water to produce them. But, you know, the, the case is that we're not providing that information into those kinds of decisions. There are some very good case studies, uh, and I probably don't have time to go into them, uh, but flood warning systems in the UK, uh, the integration of the flood forecasting center following storms and uh, floods in 2007, which brought the Environment Agency and the Met Office together to deliver coherent flood forecasting, uh, health warnings in the Caribbean, 
uh, increases in vector-borne diseases, respiratory and ocular health problems, and elevated Sahara dust as all as a result of climate change. Um, form Caribbean organizations to come together to help health practitioners integrate climate information into their national plans and co-design and deliver of climate health strategies. Uh, an integrated famine early warning system in the Sahel uh, looks at food security, provides predictions, aligns um, food banks and so on across 16 countries in West Africa. And uh, Santa Fe in Argentina, severe floods killed over 100 people and caused over 150,000 evacuations in 2003 and 2007. A disaster risk management system which brought together early warning systems, contingency plans, emergency services, new infrastructure, urban planning, all came together and that has reduced in major reductions in, in flood losses um, in subsequent floods. So there are very good case studies of how to integrate these things. And then because when you write a paper you have to tell, tell the world you know, how to solve the problem, um, uh, so this is where on the, you know, we, we were on that fairly thin limb branch of the tree walking further and further out. Well, this is where we walk, walk, walk so far out that we fall off the end. Um, these are just some fairly, uh, you, know, you might say that they're motherhood statements, but we had to put something in and I hope they're at least in, uh, informative. There's clearly a role for knowledge brokering and engagement. So levels of engagement depend on context. Um, you know, sometimes you just need consultation, sometimes you need collaboration and co-production, sometimes you need deep, deep, deep co-design. Um, and there's things like UK SIP which, which work in this space. But governments and international funding agencies need to promote context appropriate knowledge brokering, you know, how to translate the, 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 the information to meet the need, how to articulate the need in the first place so that you can meet the need. Uh, and so on. So those knowledge brokering and boundary arrangements need to be invested in. Institutions and governments. This is a, a sort of um, so-called valley of death where everybody says it's somebody else's responsibility. So national meteorological services, government and business each see it as someone else's responsibility to convert the data into decision ready form. And so it fails to be converted and fails to be used. You know, those people developing wind farms say, well, you know, we need our data as return periods and the government says, well, you're the private sector, you should do that. And they say, well, no, you're the ones who know about weather and climate information and so on. So you should be doing that and nobody does it. So clearly this is a mixed responsibility, but someone needs to take the lead in, in facilitating and investing in those multi-stakeholder institutional and governance arrangements that better integrate that knowledge, whether that be public private partnerships or, or whatever. And governments need to take the lead in at least bringing the, the parties and the stakeholders together to work out how those uh, responsibilities are going to be shared and, and work together. And finally, this is in this more systemic area, knowledge needs and research. Everybody always asks for more research. This is a bit more, bit more tailored than that, than, than just a, a plea for more money. Um, there are many areas, as I said, where weather and climate risks and how to integrate them in policy and decision makings remain poorly understood. The, don't, you know, the, the things we, we know, we don't know, we don't know. And these limits to knowledge and capacity, especially for systemic risks, increase as the impacts become longer term and more system wide. So we do need investment in trying to understand these interdisciplinary research to, and innovation on these systemic climate and weather risks and on which forms of uh, what we call cross temporal and cross spatial data analysis. So in other words, trying to understand how weather and climate feeds into these system wide risks. I mean, I, I've got, I've been collecting hundreds of examples of, of, the, of these massive system wide risks and, and, the, and the, the role that weather and climate has played in, in either triggering or exacerbating these system wide risks where weather and climate information, nobody would have even have dreamt of looking for weather and climate inf information when they were planning for those risks. So we need to make sure that we as a community are <coughs> frankly pushing ourselves forward into um, the communities that are making these decisions and saying, look, you need weather and climate information. You don't know that you need it, but you do. And uh, I think I've got probably five minutes left. So um, this is just really an aside. Um, around you know, when we talked about sustainable development and the, um, the 
um, the, you know, the, the risks, if you like, of, of where we are, you know, are we creating a sustainable future at the moment? And are we compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs? And I thought it was worthwhile just saying, you know, how does COVID feed into this? Um, and some work has been done by the UN, uh, and, and this, is, this, this, this information comes from a UN report, um, that an estimated 71 million people are expected to be pushed back into extreme poverty in 2020. And that's the first rise in global poverty since 1998. So all of those improvements that I saw you starting with the Millennium Development Goals are being pushed back as a result of COVID. Underemployment and unemployment due to the COVID mean that already some 1.6 billion people have already, already vulnerable workers in the informal economy, half the global workforce, may be significantly affected with their incomes estimated to have fallen by 60%. And that was just in the first month of uh, lockdown. Uh, the more than 1 billion slum dwellers worldwide are acutely at risk from COVID because of lack of housing, no running water, shared toilets, little or no sanitation, overcrowded public transport, and limited access to formal healthcare facilities and, of course, vaccinations. Uh, women and children, uh, and there's been a, a, a UN Women report, of which I'm a co-author, uh, looking into the impacts of COVID on uh, gender equality. And it makes quite harrowing reading. It's a long report and it, it's quite harrowing. Uh, women and children are, are amongst those bearing the heaviest burden of the pandemic effects. Disruption to health and vaccination services and limited access to diet and nutrition services have the potential to cause hundreds of thousands of additional under five deaths and tens of thousands of additional maternal deaths. That was in 2020. Uh, and many countries have seen a surge in reports of domestic violence against women and children, and also things like um, trafficking, you know, has, um, has seen a surge um, during the during the uh, during COVID. Uh, school closures have kept 90% of students worldwide uh, out of school and caused over 370 million children to miss out on school meals that they depend on. About 70 countries reported moderate to severe disruptions or a total suspension of childhood vaccination services during March and April of 2020. Uh, as more families fall into extreme poverty, children in poor and disadvantaged communities are at much greater risk of child labor, child marriage and child trafficking. In fact, the global gains of reducing child labor are likely to be reversed for the first time in 20 years. So the need to work actively and constructively to achieve the sustainable development goals and to try and put us back on a track to achieve a sustainable future of the world has never been more urgent and the role uh, so weather and climate information is at the heart of and underpins all of the activities that lead us towards a more sustainable future and i think we as a community owe it to ourselves and we owe it to the global community to ensure that the the information and the services that we hold and that we provide and the expertise that we have is brought to bear to try and create a more sustainable future for the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Very interesting talk, lots of um, food for thought. And uh, I'd like to say a big thank you, a kind of virtual round of applause from me and I'm sure from, from those in the audience as well. Um, so just a, a message to those listening in, uh, we're going to move into a Q&A session now and uh, so if you have any questions, please do add them to the chat and we'll get to uh, as many questions as we can as we go through the next kind of 40 minutes or so. Um, so Dave, there is a question actually which uh, we can start with. Um, so this uh, is basically looking at the reflection from uh, the outcome of COP26. What do you think about the current pathway regard to addressing climate change? Um, the fact that it's probably driven more on the themes of environmental protection and economic prosperity, but not social justice. Um, so do you agree with that, I guess, as a statement? And how might this hinder reaching net zero um, carbon emissions by the middle of the century? Um, I think I probably would agree with that statement. Um, again, it's part of this silo thinking, if you like, that you know we, we look at climate change really in terms of through a lens of environmental protection, and, and then we start to think about how much it will cost uh, and can we afford it. Um, you know, COP26 depends on whether you're a glass half full and a glass half, or a glass half empty. Clearly, some of the uh, decisions made on you know 
um, uh, halting deforestation and, and so on, if they're adhered to, you know, are, are a good thing. But the, you know, whether they will be implemented and whether when they are implemented, they actually take uh, a more coherent view. I mean, I've worked, for example, in uh, Indonesia and Malaysia, where things like palm oil is a, is a huge issue. And it's all very well to say, all right, we're going to stop um, you know, deforestation of rainforests for production of new palm oil plantations. But those palm oil plantations are providing the only source of income for the local community. So if you prevent that happening, then you're causing massive damage to those local communities. So not surprisingly, they'll go and cut down some more trees and plant some more palm trees because that's how they survive. And so our work was involved on in, in how to provide alternative livelihoods for those people, how to provide better livelihoods for those people so that their choices were, it was more advantageous to them to not cut down rainforest and, and plant palm oil plantations because they had a better economic and social future by not doing so. So just providing sort of a diktat to say, you know, we're going to avoid deforestation um, is, is kind of meaningless if it's, if it's not, if the, if the social and the economic aspects are not integrated within how you do that, in particular the social aspects, because what we are talking about is, you know, people's sheer survival and they will do what they need to survive. And, and that's completely understandable. So we have to provide them with better alternatives. Um, and, and so, yes, I, I would argue that probably the social justice it has not been the focus, but it needs to be when we look at trying to implement things like the Paris Accord. Great, thank you. OK, so um, question you, in, in your presentation, you obviously said there was a call for how the Met community needs to respond to help sustainability. And that, you know, it's a huge problem. So where do we begin? And it, it goes on to say, you know, with the MDGs and the SDGs, they've been embraced by non-government uh, development agencies. So that would it be a good place to start with those agencies, uh, even as a pilot scheme? Um, or do we need to kind of... Uh, you know, it, 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 you need to come in at different levels. I mean, I just welcome your view on, on I guess, how do we how do we address this really complex problem? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really complex problem, and you know, it's uh, you notice I did I completely ducked it in the presentation. Um, so, um, I mean, the answer is you have to address it at all levels. It, the, the the lead has to come from from government, uh, you know, from national government. Um, because um, they are the ones who uh, set how the playing field works, if you like. So they can you know, set policies, they can set legislation, which makes it either easier or more difficult for everybody else to play. Um, business clearly has a role to play because, as a, one of the richest people in Australia told me, um, you're not going to do this without the private sector because, frankly, Governments are broke and the private sector is rich. So if you think you're achieving this without the private sector, you're living in dreamland. Uh, and then we have to work with non-governmental organizations because those are often the people on the ground who are actually at the, <laughs> at the proverbial coalface, or let's hope it's not a coalface, um, you know, working with communities on the ground. So we have to work at all of those levels. And that, that's part of the challenges when I talk about this integration challenge. How do we get these action coherence and these multi-stakeholder partnerships to work? Um, it, it's not easy um, and of course all of those need money to oil the wheels um, um, because it costs as I said it costs time and money to do these things so I think the, I, I'm going to duck the answer again and say all of the above um, but I think there are ways to address all of the you know, specific ways to target each of those particular um, can, I, can I just kind of lead on from that so you mentioned obviously that you know the SDGs aren't perfect but they have been embraced, they are being taken forward. So do you see there's a need to revise the SDGs in any way, or do we just accept that we have an imperfect model that, that is useful and is being embraced and just push and drive forward with that? Do you have a view on that? Uh, I do. Um, so the SDGs last to 2030. The SDGs are not going to be achieved by 2030. So the big question now is, is, is what happens after 2030? And I, if I wasn't retired, I would be trying to get some of the best minds in the world together, as I did at the end of the MDGs, to get some of the best minds together to say, well, 
can we come up with a set of sustainable development goals uh, and let's publish a paper in nature and, and, and so on to try and um, get the community talking about what comes after the MDGs. I would be doing exactly the same now on the SDGs. And again, it sounds like I'm ducking every question, but the answer is both. Now, as we did with the MDGs, you wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's an awful lot of good things in the SDGs. Um, uh, but there are things that are not perfect in there. You know, they, they miss out culture, they miss out indigenous, I think there's only three mentions of indigenous people in there and so on. So there are things that, that are by, by no means perfect in the SDGs. The big question is, the SDGs were negotiated at a, a very narrow time win, a very narrow and advantageous time window when President Obama was in the White House and, and so on. And you know, if you open that Pandora's box, will you get anything at all? Because uh, that's the risk that you take. If you start to try and uh, open up uh, a new set of SDGs or, or sorry, you know, SDGs 2 or whatever, then the risk is that you will go backwards, not forwards. Um, and, and that's a, you know, that's something that you know, better minds than me need to consider. Um, but I, I do think as an academic community, we have a role now, very much now, because we still have you know, eight years to go, to start that thinking process, to, set, you know, to start to look at what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, what's missing, what are the overlaps, you know, what direction could a set of future, de future de uh, goals take, and could they be achievable? Uh, to start to um, almost um, start that conversation, because that conversation, you know, is a is an eight year conversation. It's not going to be something that happens overnight. But I think probably now is the time to to just start that conversation. Right. So leading on from that last question, so your call really for the Met community to to kind of take a lead on this. I guess the question here is about, well, what's the role of the Royal Met Society in helping the Met community <laughs> to respond? So what, what would that be? Um, it, uh, well, let's start with the completely facetious response. You can get your president to give a lecture to, to people to, to raise awareness of it. Um, and I, you know, I will be going and talking to people like the Met Office about these things. But uh, you know, as a society, you know, you know that we have you know, been starting to have these conversations about how we can play. One of the real strengths of the society is that we're one of the few organizations that can play a kind of neutral arbiter role, a trusted partner, because we have no agenda to push as such. Um, and so, you know, we can play a trusted advisor role. And so this is, uh, you know, these kinds of issues are something that we can try and feed into the conversation and feed into the discussions. And when it comes to, to brokering those multi-stakeholder partnerships, you need those trusted, impartial organizations to be able to undertake that, to, you know, to bring people together, to, to work with the different communities, to understand things from the different perspectives. Um, you know, I, I, I worked for an organization, I, I say Climate Works Australia was an organization I started. We worked on the energy market rules in Australia. And essentially what we did as a neutral arbiter was just simply shut everybody in a room for six months and, and let them argue it out until we actually got a, we actually got a resolution. That, that kind of role the society can, is, is really best placed to play because no one else can really play that role because you know, they really all have a vested interest. Okay, thank you. Um, so another question here. Um, obviously, you've, you've done a lot of work, a lot, got a lot of experience of the work you've done around the world. Could you give us some good examples of how the National Met Services have been uh, in developing countries, have provided services that really work to supporting sustainable development? Are there some really good case studies out there that you could share with us, Dave? Uh, uh, there are. I mean, the, the case studies that I mentioned are obviously, you know, um, good examples. I'm sure there are many more examples around around the world. Um, you know, I've not been working directly with National Meteorological Services for probably over 10 years now. So, and, and the science and the, the community have moved on in, in that 10 years. Um, but certainly um, there are you know, very good examples of organizations, be it National Meteorological Services and others. We, you know, there's the organization that I used to work with in Australia you know, we're doing a lot of work in Fiji, working on water resources in, in Fiji, how we can 
um, improve health and sanitation and water and weather and climate and bring all of those things, you know, uh, disaster risk management uh, and bring all of those um, aspects together in what we call informal communities, so slums, etc. In Fiji, they're not called slums, they're called informal communities. Um, how we can bring the people and work with the people in those informal communities um, to essentially make them part of the decision-making process about, process about how we improve um, the resilience of those communities um, to, to, a, to a combination of those risks. So there are organizations, NGOs, development agencies, and the National Meteorological Services all working, I'm sure, in those areas. Um, to, you know, and I'm sure there are many good case studies around. It's just I'm probably not familiar with So I know, I know obviously you've been doing a lot of work in Saudi Arabia. Maybe you could just kind of, I think you have some slides actually come in, which I, I'm, I'm aware of. So it's a, a, <laughs> an open goal for you here. But maybe you could just take us through some of the work that you've been doing and the challenges, I guess, of, of working in the, the kind of climatic region of the world to, to make um, you know, Riyadh in particular a sustainable city. So I'll leave you to, to take us through some of these slides. Yeah. Well, it's only a couple. Um, thank you, Liz, for that. Um, you know, for, the, the, the Australians call that a Dorothy Dixer. I don't know why they call it a Dorothy Dixer, but it's a, it's a tee up, you know, but to, to hit it out of the park kind of thing. So I, I've been working for the last eight years in, in, in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia for the Royal Commission for Riyadh City in trying to make Riyadh a, a more sustainable city. And this is a picture of Riyadh. And as you can see, there are, it's not a very green city. Um, you, know, you can almost play spot the tree um, you know, in, in, in the city. Uh, it's a city with some fairly uh, unique um, environmental challenges. Um, it's one of the fastest growing cities in Saudi Arabia with an annual population growth of 3.5%. Uh, it has a population of seven and a half million people and that's expected to double by 2030 to 15 million people. It's a city in the middle of the Arabian Peninsula. So in the middle of the desert, basically. Um, several high polluting industries, high level to particulate matter due to wind blown dust and sandstorms from the desert. High temperatures that have increased around two degrees since the 1970s and a city that requires two and a half million cubic meters of water per day, because they have one of the highest per capita water consumptions in the world, believe it or not, in one of the most water scarce cities uh, in the world. And the nearest source of um, uh, uh, water is about 400 kilometers away. Uh, the city generates over 30 million tons of waste every year, uh, over 1.3 million cubic meters of sewage per day, about 40% of the households are still using septic tanks, so they're not connected to the sewage network. Uh, the green cover is, as I said, almost non-existent. Um, there's been a massive loss of biodiversity due to habit, habit destruction, and one of the 10th highest carbon footprints out of the top 500 cities in the world. So the challenge that I was presented with is how do you make Riyadh sustainable? <laughs> um, and there is now a massive, and I mean massive, as in $2 trillion program, which has just been approved and announced to um, make Riyadh a much more sustainable city. And these are some of the goals and targets uh, that we've spent many years um, coming through. And I can obviously talk about these at length, but um, you know, for an oil country to move to 50% renewables by 2030, um, to have a 30% reduction in NOx, um, cuts in transport and other emissions, um, water uh, management to reuse every drop of water, um, current best uh, and reduced uh, leakage, uh, waste management, um, a city that um, drives a circular economy. Currently they have no recycling in Riyadh, everything 100% goes to landfill. Um, we're aiming to get to 90% avoidance from landfill by 2030 and 94% by 2035. Um, biodiversity, um, we're planting 15 million trees across the city, um, all of which will be watered using recycled sewage. We're building a 400 kilometer recycled sewage network, pipe network to water the trees using recycled sewage or TSE, treated sewage effluent. 30% um, uh, electric vehicle adoption uh, by 2030. Um, um, trying to get 100% of reuse and of, of water. Um, 
global best practice recycling rates. So we're introducing a, a fully integrated recycling system um, and a, a city that uh, protects natural reserves. So we're setting aside large areas, I mean large areas of the, of the greater city area for nature reserves. So you know, if, a, if a country like Saudi Arabia and a city like Riyadh can embrace sustainable development, and, and they are, I mean, they are one of the most, I, I can show you slides that show you how unsustainable they are at the moment. Um, and they have an ambition to become one of the most sustainable cities in the world. Um, enormously challenging, but yeah, as I say, that, you know, this, this comes you know, integrated off the back of the sustainable development goals. So, and, and clearly weather and climate feeds into every, every single one of these. Where are you going to put your wind farms? Where are you going to put your, your solar farms? Uh, where, where they have the best, you know, the best climate, um, you know, air quality. How are you going? You know, where the, where are the prevailing winds that the dust storms are coming in from? Where do we need to plant the the, the tree barriers that are going to um, um, you know, prevent the dust coming in from the city? Where are we going to locate the waste treatment facilities away from the community so that the the, the odor doesn't come into the into the city? Where are we going to? You know, weather and climate. Um, affects every single one of these decisions that we're making and, and trying to make sure that weather and climate is integrated into every single one of the decisions that are being and, made. And Dave, how, how are these decisions kind of pulled together? I mean, I know you've been involved in supporting it, but is it is it purely being driven at kind of government level or does it engage, I mean, obviously it's a city, so it will have local element, but is it involved in local businesses, local people? How 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 much kind of integration is that? Which not just pulling the plan together, but then implementing it so that you know they can achieve these targets by twenty thirty. Yeah, so it's being driven from the top down because that's the country that Saudi Arabia is. Um, however, it can't be, it cannot succeed without a partnership with business and partnership with the community. Uh, and that is obviously quite challenging in, in a country like Saudi Arabia. Um, so we are already working um, very closely with major businesses and, and industry uh, to, you know, to, 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 to discuss how we're going to achieve these things. We are, we, we have, we, we've developed, this is being split into five programs. One of the five programs is um, what's called a sustainable community which is how do we get the community to embrace this? Because they, have, they are ultimately the ones who are going to have to recycle. They are going to be the ones that have to put their, you know, should, uh, reduce their water consumption. They're the ones who are going to have to buy electric vehicles. They're the ones who are going to have to use public transport. They're the ones who are going... So we have a, you know, one fifth of the program is going to be centered around working with the community. We're, we're setting up uh, community groups and we're setting up NGOs um, we're, we're, we're having a whole uh, raft of um, uh, initiatives and programs to, uh, you know, to engage the community, which is something, believe me, is, is extraordinarily novel in a, in, in, a, in a city like Riyadh. And, and as, as yet, I'll give you uh, one example. We, 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 we formed a, a Friends of Riyadh environment. And in the desert, the habit is for people to go and camp in the desert for the weekend. Um, and then go back at the end of the weekend. And they just leave all of their litter and rubbish in the desert because the desert's big and you can just leave everything there. And so we had a, a litter clearing campaign in the desert. We asked for volunteers who, um, from the community to come and help do a desert cleanup campaign. And I asked how it went and they said it was terrible. It's awful. I said, what was the problem? They said, we had hundreds of people turn up. They said, we didn't know what to do with them. We had to feed them. We, we couldn't take all the rubbish away. It was, it was awful. <laughs> so, so clearly they have some way to go <laughs> in, in terms of embracing the community. But there is clearly a community out there wanting to participate. And I guess, you know, you're, you're heavily involved with this and, you know, obviously providing information to try and meet the targets uh, by 2030. But how, how, in reality, how likely are they to meet these targets, do you think? They won't meet these targets. Um, well, that's the wrong. They will meet these targets, but they will not meet them by 2030. That's You just simply cannot build that many wind farms and solar farms in that short a period of time. Um, 
it's just not possible but it will happen when they when they say they are going to do something that they, they do it i mean they decide we, one of the initiatives was to build a public transport system a subway system um, and within a, a year or two every boring machine in the world was in riyadh every tunnel boring machine in the world was in riyadh um, so it will happen Okay, so I have another question. Uh, so when discussing climate change mitigation, the need for a just transition is often stressed. So do you think that this encompasses the necessary social and economic legs of the stool that you showed us at the beginning of your presentation? Uh, I'm not sure if, I mean, I've heard the term just transition, but the fact that, that it's in capital letters there, I'm wondering whether there's a, something more formal around it rather than just, oh, we need a just transition. Um, if that's the case, then it's something that I'm not familiar with. Um, but clearly, there is now a whole science coming up around transitions, a whole scientific community growing up around transitions. Um, there's been a large you know, UN effort around transitions and there are, um, and, and how, we, you know, how do we bring transformation about so it's one of the fastest growing research fields that I'm aware of is, is how we try and bring about a just transition right? and how do we get people to you know, both change their behavior and so on. So it's a, it's a but, but whether that, that particular term just transition is something formal that I'm missing, I don't know. Um, but if it's going to happen, it has to embrace. Um, the social and economic legs of the so team. Brian if you're still on the call if you if you want to just respond if you want to expand on just transition that that would be helpful and we can maybe try and follow up on that uh, in a minute so Dave I guess it would uh, it would be rude of me not to comment on some of the work the society has been doing around uh, sustainability and and some of the activities particularly this year in the run-up to cop 26 and um, obviously, you and I have been involved in, in leading on the society's uh, net zero strategy, and we announced our pledge this year, uh, which was, you know, about taking the society to net zero. So for those who are less familiar, there are various scopes under net zero. Some of them are things that you can deal with in-house and some are more external uh, activities that, that lead to um, your carbon footprint. And, and our pledge is about taking the in-house things, the things that we can manage uh, and making uh, the society net zero by 2025. So just a few years from now, and then to manage the, the outsourced uh, net zero activities by, um, well, hopefully by 2030. But again, there's a lot of that is dependent on um, you know, technology advances and so forth. Uh, we also launched a new journal and I'm going, I know you, that's something that is very close to your heart, uh, the Climate uh, Sustainability and Resilience Journal that we launched uh, at the end of 2020 and obviously starting now to publish papers. Um, and obviously our activity in the run up to COP26 and during COP26, so we had a team of people at, at, in Glasgow, we were delivering uh, daily bulletins, both into schools, but also to the general public and the schools videos I know were extremely popular. I know you yourself were kind of looking at those on a, a daily basis as well, Dave, uh, you know, aiming just to keep that conversation going with, with children in, in schools. Uh, and, and again, the teachers kind of taking those videos and in, incorporating them into morning registration to keep that conversation going. But I guess, you know, is, are there any kind of thoughts, you know, your, your role as president of the society, um, you know, the kind of, I guess, the things that you're proud of so far, the things that you maybe want to try and take forward and push forward in, in the remaining kind of year that you've got as president, any thoughts from you? Yeah, I mean, when you've, men you've mentioned a lot of the things that I'm proud of, the, particularly the net zero, um, something that, you know, I've, I've pushed in the society. Um, the new journal, I can't speak highly enough of the new journal, even though they turned down one of my papers last week, um, which I'm deeply offended by. Um, but it shows, it shows you that they don't just let anybody in. Um, um, you know, seriously, I, I mean, I, I think one of the things that um, I, I'm, I mean, you know, when, when, when I came in as president, I, you look across an organization and you, you say, you know, what are they doing that they shouldn't be doing? And what aren't they doing that they should be doing? And I, I think it's the first organization I've come into where I have to answer those questions. Well, you know, <laughs> actually it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, the, the, the program is hugely ambitious. 
considering the size of the organization, the scope of the work in terms of you know, the education and the support for the scientific community and the support, support to the science is just outstanding. I mean, I think where I'm coming from is to try and you know, put a few frilly bits around the edge in terms of trying to just say, OK, you know, let, let's you know, look a little bit wider than just our own community and see how we as a community affect the, the wider world. Um, and that's both in our own operations through things like Net Zero and, and walking the talk, um, and in our engagement through things like, you know, how, how we do, we do we impact on sustainable development? And how do we play a role? I mean, clearly the society is there as a, a, a provider of trusted and factual information, but also we have a role to play in what I would, you know, in, in terms of not advocacy in the, in the sense of a, an advocacy organization like a Greenpeace or so on but in terms of making the case for action when that case for action is supported by the science. So what you might call evidence-based advocacy. You know, where, where, the, where the science is clear, we should be advocating for that science to be taken into account and taken on board in a, in a more um, forthright way, if you like. So again, I think that's one of the other directions that I've been, as you know, I've been trying to ease us gently towards obviously I, we, we don't want to, you know it's a, it's a very fine line to tread and we don't want to lose our credibility or scientific reputation or our ability to play that neutral and trusted partner role um, but in many cases the case for action is in <laughs> in ipcc terminology unequivocal um, and where that case for action is unequivocal we should be saying so um, without being policy prescriptive or or, or whatever um, so I think, um, yeah, the, I think there's a, a lot, you know, the society is doing an immense amount um, of great work and um, you know, at the risk of, of burdening the, the, the overworked staff even more, uh, there are just a few directions that I'd like to sort of ease us into. Right. Thank you for that. So one final question for me before, and if there are any more questions, please put them in the chat. Um, so your last slide that you finished your talk on was about COVID-19 and the impact that that had on the sustainable development goals. But are there any lessons that you think we can learn from a global pandemic that, that can actually help us to deliver the sustainable development goals? I know there was a negative impact and that, you know, that was highlighted in your last slide or the last couple of slides, but there must be things we can learn from COVID-19 that actually can help, you know, drive and deliver and support the, the SDGs. That's another nice topic, because that's the paper that's just been rejected by the journal. <laughs> um, yeah, there, are, there clearly are lessons that we can learn. Um, I mean, we've all, you know, the old, there are some obvious ones, like we've all learned to work, to work on Zoom and work from home and, and, and things like that. And, um, we have to be careful, of course, that working from home isn't actually less sustainable because we, we have to heat 50 individual homes as opposed to one workplace. Uh, and things like that. So we have to we have to work through that. But of, you know, not be not having to travel uh, to meetings and so on. But I think there's broader lessons to be learned, uh, and and that's those are things like how to use scientific information in policy making. You know, we we've seen the Sage Committee here in the UK, um, where you know the three wise men, as they're called, you know, the the Prime Minister and the, the Patrick Valance and so on, are standing there giving daily briefings. Um, and everybody recognizes that the decisions that are being made are policy decisions, but clearly they are being informed by the science on a daily basis. And those scientists are there giving that information, providing that information, and are clearly what I would say are inside the tent, if you like. When they are talking as individual scientists, they can not stick to the party line and say, you know, I think we should be doing X, Y, Z. But once when they're in the tent, you know, they, they, they follow the party line and they, they are there advising the government. Um, so I think there are lessons to be learned about how we, you know, how scientific information and, and, and the use of, of scientific expertise can be used in, in real time, if you like, in decision making. I, I think COVID is, another, is an also is an example of how to work across departmental silos because COVID has cut across you know, it started off in health, but it has now cut across everything from, you know, you know, economic and social and, and work and furlough schemes and so on. Uh, and those departments have had to, there have had to be, you know, interdepartmental committees, if you like, that have come together to manage the, to manage the crisis 
in a much more interdisciplinary way than they've ever done before. And again, I think that's a lesson that can be learned in terms of sustainable, sustainable development. And some countries have indeed do that, done that. In many countries, they have set up interdepartmental bodies within government to manage sustainable development. In Japan, for example, they have a committee which actually sits above all of the individual, directly under the prime minister's office, which sits under all of the different, above all of the different departments and coordinates all of the activities across the different departments. Uh, so there, you know, there are method, methods like that that, um, you know, that we can learn from. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot we can learn from um, that, and you can read the paper when it's published, not in. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Well, okay. Well, I think we'll move over that one quickly then about the journal, and ho hopefully we get to see that paper published soon. But yeah, I don't see any more. Sorry, Dave. Yeah. It's been, sorry, yeah. It's, it's been accepted yeah. elsewhere. Don't worry. Um, I don't see any more questions actually in the chat. So um, I'd just like to, to thank you for what was a very stimulating, stimulating presentation and, and a really interesting question and answer session. Actually, I think we we got to kind of hear you know, some other elements that, that weren't covered in the presentation. And I'm, I'm glad we managed to to kind of home in on, on the work you've done in Riyadh as well. So a huge thank you from me. And, and again, I'm sure there's a kind of virtual uh, thank you from, from those on the call as well. So I've got a couple of slides just to, to close off, if I can put those up. Oop, let's go back to what I want to say. Um, first of all, just to, to thank everybody for attending uh, this presidential lecture, the first time we've done a virtual presidential lecture. Uh, the talk has been recorded and will be published on our YouTube channel and you can see the link to that on this slide here. So uh, that'll be uh, uploaded in the next uh, day or so. So if you want to, to watch the video back and we'll also be publicizing this widely as, as one of our public lectures as well. Uh, if you're interested in any more of the events that the society is running, you can see another link uh, at the bottom of this slide, uh, lots of virtual events taking place, both um, being uh, run from the Society's central office here in Reading, but also from our local centres as well around the UK. And finally, just a plug for our calendar. Um, so if you're desperately trying to think of a perfect, perf uh, perfect Christmas present for somebody who's interested in, in meteorology, then this is probably an ideal present. So this is our um, 2022 calendar and it's got images from our 2021 weather photographer of the year competition um, so order now uh, for christmas and again there's the shop url link at the bottom of this slide just to note that i think last post is next tuesday so get your orders in quick if you want to make the, the christmas post um, but without further ado just a huge thank you again to you dave um, I'm hopeful before you finish your presidential um, term, in, uh, which is obviously ends in September next year, that we might have the opportunity to get you out to, to one of our face-to-face -face events, which we're hoping to kind of start doing a couple more as we go into 2022, fingers crossed. Um, but a big thank you from me, uh, and I'm sure a thank you from, from everybody on the call, and, and thanks everybody for joining, but we'll close the meeting there. Thank you. <laughs>